The idea of what atoms are like came about gradually. J.J. Thompson discovered that atoms are made up of positive and negative charges. He came up with the plum pudding model of the atom, positive charge with lots of little electrons dotted around it. It was Ernest Rutherford who then found out that the positive part of the atom must be incredibly small. We call this the nucleus, and we know the electrons must be far away from it. Niels Bohr later discovered that electrons exist in shells or orbitals. Then James Chadwick discovered that the nucleus must also contain some neutral charges. He called these neutrons, while we call the positive charges protons. Different types of atoms are represented by symbols, which we also find in the periodic table. The bottom number is the atomic number. This is the number of protons in the nucleus. This is what determines what element you actually have. The top number is the mass number. This tells you how many protons and neutrons are in the nucleus. So that means that this carbon atom has six neutrons on top of its six protons to make a mass of 12. However, you can get a carbon atom with seven neutrons instead, so its mass is 13. These are isotopes, atoms of the same element but different numbers of neutrons. The term radiation means any particle or wave that's emitted by something. Electromagnetic waves, those found in the EM spectrum, they're all radiation and they're all emitted by electrons. Well, all apart from gamma radiation, that is. This is actually emitted by the nucleus of an atom if it has excess energy to get rid of. Gamma rays are high energy EM waves, so they can be dangerous as they can ionize atoms if absorbed by them, knocking electrons off. This can cause damage to the cells in your body and also cause cancer. But there are two other types of ionizing radiation nuclei can emit too. But these are actual particles and they're emitted when nuclei decay, they change, they break down. Generally, the more neutrons an isotope has, the more unstable it is and the more likely it is to decay. Heavier nuclei, like americium-241, decay by alpha decay to become more stable. The nucleus will emit a bundle of two protons and two neutrons, what we just call an alpha particle. This is alpha radiation. This is what the nuclear decay equation looks like for this. To show that the nucleus is decayed into two parts, the alpha particle, which must have an atomic number of two and a mass of four, and the daughter nucleus, that's just the nucleus that's left over, which of course is no longer going to be americium, as it's lost two protons to go from an atomic number of 95 to 93. Turns out this is now Neptunium, but you'll never have to remember these. You just need to worry about the numbers, it's just maths. 95 goes to 93 and two, and the mass is similar, 241 goes to 237 and 4. But there is actually a nucleus that has the numbers 2 and 4. It's a helium nucleus, so you'd get the mark whether you put an alpha symbol or HE. Lighter nuclei, like carbon-14, decay by beta or beta radiation instead. What actually happens is that a neutron in the nucleus decays into a proton and an electron. This electron escapes the nucleus and it's travelling very fast. This is what we call beta radiation. The mass of an electron is basically zero, so we put that on top, and it has the opposite charge to a proton, so we say it has an atomic number of minus one. Now be careful with the numbers here. Six goes to what plus minus one? No, it's not five, it's six is equal to seven plus minus one. Like we said, a neutron has turned into a proton, so the nucleus has gained a proton, it's gone from six to seven, but the mass, however, is unchanged, so it's still 14. Again, you get the mark if you put a beta symbol or E for the beta radiation. Alpha particles are massive, so as they travel, they knock loads of electrons off loads of atoms in their way. We say they have a high ionizing ability or high ionizing power, but as a result, they're stopped easily. They're stopped by a few centimeters of air or just a piece of paper. If you have a GM, Geiger-Muller tube, touching a source of alpha radiation, like americium, it will detect the alpha radiation emitted. Move it a bit further away or stick a piece of paper in between and the radiation counts per second will fall to zero or near zero anyway. I say near zero because there are background sources of radiation from the world and universe around us. Radon gas comes out of concrete and rocks. That's slightly radioactive. Cosmic rays from space are also background radiation. Man-made radiation, like that from nuclear weapons, contributes to it too. So if you want an accurate radiation count over a minute from an alpha source, say, you should do a background count first, then take that number away from the count with the source. This will give you a corrected count. Beta radiation is not as ionizing as alpha, but it has a higher penetrating ability. It's fairly good at both. It can pass through more air and a piece of paper, but it's still absorbed by a few millimeters of aluminium. It can be used to detect thickness of thin materials like paper made in a paper mill. Even though they're high energy waves, gamma radiation has relatively low ionizing ability. So why is it so dangerous? Well, it's because it can actually get to you. Technically, there's nothing that can completely stop gamma radiation, but lead and concrete can reduce its intensity by absorbing some of it. Gamma radiation has many uses, actually. 
It can be used for radiotherapy or gamma knife surgery to kill cancer tumours in your brain, for example. And it can be used to sterilise medical equipment, as it kills any microbes on the scalpel and tongs, etc. Radioactivity is the rate of decay of a source of alpha, beta or gamma radiation. Now, you know it's not really decay with gamma, but it's the same idea. This rate can be measured with a GM tube, like we said, and we can calculate it by doing radiation count divided by time in seconds. This gives you the radioactivity, sometimes just called activity, in counts per second, which is also called Becquerel, BQ for short. Over time, the number of unstable nuclei in a source decreases as they're decaying into something else, so that means the activity decreases too. Half-life is what we call the time it takes for both of these to half. The half-life of a radioactive isotope could be days, months, even millions of years. If we draw a graph to show how activity changes over time, it will look something like this. So how do we find the half-life from this? Well, we take the initial number and we halve it, then draw a line to the curve to see how long that took. What's interesting that, if we do the same again from that number, it will take the same amount of time to half. It doesn't matter how much of the isotope you have, or when you start timing, it will always take the same amount of time to half. You could also be asked to calculate half-life. Let's say that we have a sample that started at 96 Becquerel activity and it fell to 12 Becquerel after one year, 12 months. The question you always have to ask is how many half-lives? You don't do 96 divided by 12. Instead, you count how many times you had to halve it to get to the second number. One half-life gets you to 48 Becquerel. Two half-lives, 24. Halving again once more gets us to 12. It took three half-lives to decrease from 96 to 12 Becquerel. So if 12 months is three half-lives, that means that one half-life is a third of that, so four months. If you take a nucleus like uranium-235 and fire a neutron at it, that neutron will be absorbed and will make the nucleus more unstable. But instead of decaying by alpha or beta, it actually splits in half, producing two similar daughter nuclei. This is nuclear fission. You might see it called induced fission. What's weird though is that the total mass of the products of this fission is less than what we had to begin with. How's that possible? Well, it turns out that mass can turn into energy in these situations. Yes, we say that energy can't be created or destroyed, but at this level, we say that the reactants have mass energy to get around that. The energy produced is thermal, or more accurately, kinetic energy. Here's the clever thing. This fission event also releases up to three more neutrons that can go off and cause more fission in other nuclei themselves, and so on and so on, and more energy is released. We now have a chain reaction. Left unchecked, this can go out of control. That's what an atomic or nuclear bomb is. However, if you control this chain reaction in a nuclear reactor, you can produce a consistently safe and huge amount of energy that can then be used to turn water into steam that turns a turbine connected to a generator, etc. Like fission, fusion turns mass into energy. This is what happens in the sun. But unlike fission, this time two light nuclei, like hydrogen, fuse together into a heavier one, helium in this case, and energy is released, but only if they have lots of kinetic energy to begin with. But hang on, how can both fission and fusion result in energy released? Well, it's all to do with what nuclei you have to begin with. Scientists have been trying to make fusion reactors for decades, but they haven't managed to make one where they're able to harness enough energy from the radiation released from the process for it to be viable. So I hope you found that helpful. Leave a like and a comment if you did. And click on the card to take you to the playlist for all of the papers. And don't forget to check out the Science Shorts app to help you test your knowledge.